Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about how to convert alkylates to alcohols. So I'm going to differentiate those between primary, secondary, and tertiaries, and eventually I'll talk about the allylic and benzylic halides as well. So to start out with, the primary alkyl halides, uh, suppose I got this example of primary alkyl halide here, and this X uh, could be anything from chlorine, bromine, and iodine. For this, since this is a primary, the only thing the primaries can really do well would be an SN2 reaction. And for the SN2 reactions to take place, I need to have a strong nickel So I need to use a hydroxide ion there. And I remember that hydroxide ions could be coming from anything, something like uh, NaOH, or I could be using KOH. Uh, any alkali metal hydroxide that provides the uh, hydroxide ion there would be able to do an SN2 reaction. And this is just going to do an backside attack here. And your halogen is going to leave at the same time. So this is going to take place in one step. And at the end of the day, my product is going to have an OH there. Now, this one is not a chiral center, so I don't really have to worry about what's happening with the stoichiometry. Uh, but remember, we can just do this SN2 within a strong nickel file. Now, remember the hydroxide, along with being a strong nickel file, it's also a strong base, so you have to be really careful using it if you have any other alkyl halide beside primary alkyl halides. Um, Suppose for the secondary and tertiary alkyl halides, if I go ahead and use NaOH, then this uh, hydroxide being a strong nucleophile and a strong base, rather doing an SN2, it's actually going to do an E2, and you may end up getting a product that would be an alkene. Obviously, we're not really trying to make an alkene, but I just can't give you an example here. But that would happen if you use a strong nucleophile and a strong base here. Uh, so to avoid that, I actually want to use a weak nucleophile that can still give you an OH at the end of the day. And that's going to be the water in this case. So that would do an SN1 reaction. So remember, this SN1 will do to uh, undergo two mechanisms, uh, two steps where the chloride would leave, make the carbocation, and then eventually you can make a racemic mixture if your particular carbocation carbon is chiral center. But in this case, this carbon that's uh, connected to the chlorine is not really chiral center, so I can go ahead and have the OH attached to it. So I'm not really showing the mechanism here because SN1 and SN2 has already been talked about. Um, Looking at this next one, so this one is actually a secondary alkyl halide. The previous one was tertiary alkyl halide. So the secondary alkyl halide, you got to be really careful with what you can use here. So suppose if I go ahead and use a strong base, strong nucleophile, something like in a hydroxide, uh, potassium hydroxide to make an alcohol. But the problem here, instead of having only the SN2, you actually going to have an E2 as well because in a secondary alkyl halide with a strong base, strong nucleophile will do SN2 and E2. And even in that case, E2 usually predominates. It's going to be major over the SN2. Um, so I may get a little bit of SN2 there, but that's going to be the minor. And then the majority of that would be a E2, where I will be getting this particular alkyl, uh, alkene there. That's going to be your E2 product, and that's going to be the major. Now, when I say the major and minor, it's not going to be 90%, 10%. It's going to be somewhere around you know 60% major and 40% minor, or maybe 70% major and 30% minor. So there is not a big difference in uh, them being uh, in, in the ratios of major and the minor in this particular case. So to avoid any of the E2 here, and I, if I just want to have an SN2 here, then I would have to use a weak nucleophile weak base, and that's going to be the water. But the problem with the water now is, since it's a weak nucleophile weak base, 
and we're dealing with in a secondary alkyl halide, this is actually going to go in an SN1 mechanism. And if this goes in SN1 mechanism, and I actually do want to draw the mechanism of that just a little bit. So the first step in SN1 would be the loss of leaving group. So when your leaving group leaves, you make this carbocation. Now, this particular carbocation is actually going to be the secondary carbocation. And anytime you make a secondary carbocation, you want to be on, uh, on the look to see if you can make a more stable carbocation. So if I could move one of this hydrogen from here onto this location, that would be your 1,2 hydride shift. that would make a more stable carbocation. That's going to be the tertiary carbocation. And then you're going to have the water actually attacking at that particular position. All right, so I'm just going to copy this for the sake of time. So this is not a chiral center, so I don't really have to worry about the stereochemistry there. So you got the OH2 there, and then uh, mechanistically, I can go ahead and use, in the last step, I can go ahead and use either water to deprotonate that uh, uh, hydrogen there to get the hydrogen out, or I can even use the chloride. So either one of those are going to be fine mechanistically. A lot of time, practically, you would uh, you would work up this uh, reaction with a base. All right, so you actually end up getting a alcohol now, but that particular alcohol, let me move this down a little bit. So I do get the alcohol at the end of the day, but then I don't, I didn't really get the alcohol I really wanted to get at that particular position because of the carbocation rearrangement. So you have to be really careful uh, with that as well, because if you use in a strong base, strong nucleophile, then you will end up getting an elimination there as your major product, and if you want to get only the substitution, you would end up getting the carbocation rearrangement in that particular case. Okay, let's look at some of the allylic and benzylic halides. So suppose if I have this uh, benzylic bromide here, and if I go ahead and use NaOH on this one. Now, this particular uh, alkyl halide does have an, a beta carbon here, but this beta carbon does not have any proton on it. So since it doesn't have any hydrogen on it, I don't really have to worry about this undergoing an elimination reaction. So the only thing it can really do would be the substitution. So it's going to be an OH there. So if I do use an NaOH, this will do an SN2 mechanism where, you know, the lone pair from this oxygen is going to attack here and the leaving group is going to leave at the same time and it's going to make the end product. But what if I use water? What, how the product is really going to change in that particular case? If I do use water, I know water is a weak nucleophile, weak base, so it's not really going to do an SN2, but rather it's going to do an SN1, so where you actually lose this bromine first, makes a carbocation, and then your water attacks. But at the end of the day, your product is actually still going to be the same. Your product is really not going to change. Even though, um, even though um, it's not, there's no chirality involved at the position where the, uh, where the carbon is attached to the bromine, so you don't really have to worry about what the product is going to be made. So whether you use NaOH or water, your product will be the same, even though you will be undergoing different mechanisms. Okay, so what about if I have, so there's supposed to be a BR there. So what if I have a beta carbon at the other side? So I got the beta carbon here that has the proton. Now I got to worry about the SN2 and the E2. So since this is in a benzylic alkyl halide and um, the benzylics are kind of similar to the secondaries where they can go all type of uh, mechanisms, SN1, SN2, E1, E2. So if I use a strong nucleophile, strong base here, then it will do both an E2 and an SN2, where E2 is still going to predominate there. So in that particular case, I, I would have two products made. So I would have an OH there. I, I'm not really worrying about the stereochemistry here because I didn't really have any stereochemistry drawn in the beginning here. 
and then I would also have the other product where your double bond is going to be right here. So this is going to be the SN2 and this is going to be the E2. If I have to draw the SN2 in terms of stereochemistry and if I, let's say, go ahead and make this coming out of the page for the sake of stereochemistry, then this OH would be going back into the case, uh, back into the page because it involves in a complete inversion of stereochemistry. But this one, E2 is still going to dominate there over the SN2 just because you have a strong base and a strong nucleophile. So if I want to just have an alcohol product or just a substitution product, I would rather use water in that case. But when I use the water, it's going to do an SN1 mechanism. And when it does the SN1 mechanism, you will get a mixture of product in terms of enantiomers. So I can have the OH going back into the page. And then I can also have the OH coming out of the page. So that's the difference there. So you get a pair of enantiomers there. Okay, uh, so if you're really trying to get an alcohol here, you rather want to do an SN1 where you just use water instead of using the NaOH. But sometimes it doesn't matter. Like in the previous case, I would actually go ahead and use NaOH because I don't have to worry about this previous uh, reactant undergoing any of the eliminations. So this is the, let's look at this last example, and it's going to be very similar, right? If I use NaOH, I will have the fear that it's going to have both the SN2, let's say I put KOH there, so it's going to have both SN2 and E2. I mean, you can selectively get E2 if you use a bulky base or a non-nucleophilic base, something like NaH or LDA, but if you use KOH, then you will get both of them. So you will get a product that's going to be an alkene like this and then you will also get a product that's going to be an OH there but if I don't want to get both of them so this is still going to be the major one and uh, if I want to just use water in this case then it will do a SN1 mechanism. And the problem with that, once it makes the carbocation, so let me just go ahead and copy this down here. It makes this carbocation, but then this carbocation can have the resonances. So once it has the resonances, this can come down here. And when this comes down here, we will get a, another resonance structure with the positive charge being right here. So then once you have this resonance structure, your water can actually attack any one of those. So you have the possibility of getting both of them. You could control the product, uh, one product over the other by controlling the temperature, but uh, typically you will get both of those. So I'm not really going to draw the resonance th uh, the mechanism there. But at the end of the day, you have the possibility of getting actually three types of products there. I'm going to draw that here. And I'm also going to put that down here. And I'll explain that why three only. So we'll take this stuff out. So since this, uh, the first uh, resin structure has a chiral center, so I could have the OH either coming out of the page or OH going back into the page. So I didn't really draw the intermediate mechanism there, but you guys get the idea that the oxygen is going to attack that carbocation position. But this second resonance structure doesn't really have any chiral center, so I can just go ahead and only have a one in there. So the, those are the three possible alcohols you can get in that particular case. 